You're listening to Energy Insiders, a weekly update on clean energy and climate policy with Renew Economies editor Giles Parkinson and leading energy analyst David Leach. Energy Insiders is brought to you by Evergen, providing cutting-edge energy management software for battery optimization, virtual power plants and distributed energy resources. And Pylon, helping solar installers and retailers design high-resolution solar proposals in minutes. Hello and welcome to this latest episode of the Energy Insiders podcast. My name is Giles Parkinson and I'm the editor of Renew Economy and its associated websites, the EV focused on the driven and one step off the grid. And joining me as usual is ITK principal David Leach. David, um, I trust you all. Giles, I'm well. Trust the audience as well. And we've got uh, a great interview this week uh, with someone who knows a lot about uh, prices and uh, bits of the market that we don't always talk about. Not just the price of everything, but the value of most things as well. Um, yes, um, Rick Brazali uh, from Green Energy Markets. Uh, many people will know him. And um, look, we've talked a lot about energy prices, but not enough probably about LGCs and all the other bits of the market. And um, there's a bit of news to talk about too, David, which we'll come back to after the interview. But uh, look, I think let's just hop straight into the interview with Rick and um this is what he had to say um, earlier this afternoon. Rick Brazzani from Green Energy Trading. Um, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Giles. Great to be here. Look, it's um, a lot to talk about. We get so focused on energy markets, we kind of forget about all the other markets that exist in the um, in the world, and particularly in Australia, and particularly re- re- relating to things like LGC markets and energy efficiency markets. Um, we've also got the proposal for the regos, the Renewable Energy Guarantee of Origin Markets. There's a bit of controversy around that. But look, let's start with the LGCs. Now, um, I've probably said this before, but I thought LGCs were supposed to be zero by now because we met the Renewable Energy Target. Can you remind our listeners why it's not at zero? Um, Okay. Well, look, in simple terms, um, we have two sources of uh, demand for LGCs. There's the mandated target, which um, essentially uh, maxed out or sort of reached the peak uh, back a couple of years ago. But we also have voluntary demand. Um, And so that's um, corporate um, sort of green power, um, uh, local councils and others uh, wanting to be 100% renewables or to essentially um, uh, reduce their scope to emissions, which is electricity, and will... either buy green power or voluntarily surrender LGCs. Um, and so that that's growing to be a significant um, a sort of demand for LGCs. And that's been the main reason why um, there's still sort of value in LGCs. Rick, I think um, that's about a quarter of the LGC market now is voluntary surrender or something. I think um, I think that's about right, uh, David. That's um, where we are at the moment. But we also track... Um, commitments by corporates, governments, and others, um, local governments and others, to um, uh, and we see that growing to uh, by 2025 is growing, probably even doubling, um, so becoming a half or even more of the mandated target. Um, what we've seen though is that it's a bit sketchy, um, and uh, with uh, let's call it cost of living, you know, economic pressures. Some businesses are sort of delaying their surrender of LGCs. And so we think that might have been one of the reasons why there's been a recent correction late, lately. And so, so tell us about where, where the price has been. I mean, I think the latest price I've seen is about $40. That seems to be down slightly from previously. So tell me, where's it been and, and, and where's it going? Well, look, it has been, let, let's say the, um, call it the spot or well, the price, you know, or the uh, price in the next year or so uh, had been above fifty dollars not so long ago, um, and it's drifted lower over the last call it nine twelve months, and more recently probably the last um, I'd say three three weeks or so it's come off again reasonably markedly. So from around um, this is spot forty five dollars or so down to um, I think it traded at thirty eight or lower even. And, and Rick. Um, uh, uh, what what does the voluntary surrender tell us? I mean, the scheme is due to end at 2030, it, it, when in theory, I guess, except for paying back of borrowed certificates, that the price really should be zero. But in, in your opinion, 
what does this voluntary surrender tell us about the uh, likely value of being green post-2030? What, what, what will people pay for it? Well, it, look, it's a really good question, David, because in the end, once the grid, you know, I mean, we have the sort of federal labour aiming to um, uh, have 82% renewals by 2030, um, so there ain't much left if you're if you're 82% renewables, and so the, it's really interesting. So the question is, well, who's going to pay for renewables if we're all basically already renewables? You don't need to pay for it, um, and so um, so it's really not clear how uh, how things are going to you know evolve after 2030. And I suspect, though, um, this is a personal view, is that we're well off track on meeting the um, you know 80 percent renewables by um, by 2030 and with the drive to electrification um, of uh, stationary energy and then also the um, uh, you know increasing use of EVs um, our electricity consumption is going to be much higher uh, than people are expecting and we're going to be we're going to be miles off um, meeting 82 80 percent um, Unless we have other government policy measures, which we're, you know, ourselves and others have been advocating for, um, so there may still be um, a role for some value for um, LGCs in the voluntary market. Um, but yeah, it's post twenty thirty, but it's hard to see how, how whether that's going to be that material though. Mm. I'm just I'm kind of curious now. Um, how far off do you think we are on current projections, and, and and what are just very briefly some of these other policy measures that um, that you want um, introduced? Um, well, actually, it depends on uh, it depends on your assumptions around electrification um, and the like. But um, so some states like Victoria are getting close. Um, New South Wales is quite a way behind, um, and then you've got you know um, sort of WA is a, a way behind. Um, and then, uh, but part of the reason it's behind is because um, the underlying level of, cons- of consumption of electricity is increasing. Um, and so, therefore, we need a higher level of ambition. So, and the policy measures um, we're looking at um, is well, you've got, um, you know, the um, sort of uh, what you call the capacity. Um, Sort of what it, these are the federal government um, capacity program. Um, CIS capacity investment scheme, yeah. Capacity investment scheme. Thank you, David. Uh, it was on the tip of my tongue, um, but that's but we've got trouble um, sort of rolling out large, some large scale renewables, in particular wind, and then large scale solar now is much more difficult uh, because of the hollowing out at the midday pricing. Uh, so you really need to do. You really need to sort of quite a big investment in batteries for solar, and then you've got transmission issues. So um, so the rollout of large scale is falling behind where we really need it to be. And so we've been advocating that we just need to mobilise um, sort of uh, households and small businesses to put solar on their roof um, and also put storage on their roofs, or not so much on their roof, but to, to in- install behind the meter storage. Um, and then that's a really great way to actually also obviate the need for um, distribution network augmentation, which is another big risk that we could spend another half an hour talking about. Um, it's one of the major risks on electrification. You've, you've given me a horrifying image of uh, rooftop batteries there, uh, Rick, which I'm not going to dwell on. Uh, just conscious of time today, and I wanted to move on to uh, another policy, which is the safeguard scheme and the tightening of it. And this has had, as I can, I think, a big impact on the Australian Carbon Credit Union unit uh, price. What's been happening in that market? From where I look at the data, and it's a bit old, and I'm, I may not understand it properly, it looks like the supply of those units has gone up dramatically, perhaps to match the demand, and therefore the price hasn't moved very much. But what what can you tell us? Oh, David, you'd probably need a take 15 minutes to go through this. The, the tricky thing with the um, uh, with the ACU market is, yes, we now have um, uh, demand from the safeguard entities, but bear in mind the, um, the safeguard baselines sort of are really, uh, they drop only modestly short term. They will ramp up. 
Uh, so the demand will increase. The other issue, though, is you might recall the previous government had the Emission Reduction Fund. And so the clean energy regulator went out and contracted a whole bunch of um, offset projects. And our business had two projects that we had registered um, and two reg registered that we sold. Uh, we were successful in getting a couple of contracts with the clean energy regulator. An announcement back a couple of years ago when Angus Taylor uh, was the minister is they essentially allowed the a lot of those initial projects were at really low prices, low carbon prices, think, you know, $15 or less. And so the clean energy regulator now gave um, project developers and proponents uh, the ability to buy back their accus and sell them on the, um, in the wholesale market, so to speak. And so all of a sudden, we've got a, a big chunk of supply that comes from a whole lot of existing projects now no longer or sort of exiting contracts with the clean energy regulator. And they'll do that um, if, as soon as the price gets really high, it'll be more attractive to sell your ac accus into the wholesale market than selling them to the clean energy regulator. So it's a really little wrinkle to the scheme, but it's really important. And because you might recall that the accu price got up over $50 a few years ago, government made this announcement and then the price crashed to, well, it got to about... I think in the 20s, uh, so t sort of $27, $28, and has subsequently recovered over the last couple of years. And, and so it's now only, it's only, now only sort of what, what is it, $37 now? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to, um, I, I really want to understand the, the big picture as, as you see it. Um, so let me just ask these questions. Leaving aside the, the buyback, which is like inventory, in terms of new projects and new supply, is that increasing at the moment for accus, carbon farming or whatever? Yeah, yeah, there, there is. There's more, pro, you know, as the price, um, but it's a function of price. As the price has now been relatively stable, uh, there is more projects being developed. Uh, but the the accu market is really tricky at the moment because of um, concerns around quality of offsets. Yes, and some, yes. I, I, and, yes, I... I, 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 I that's a big topic that uh, we should cover, but maybe not today. I'm just going to assume for the sake of this one conversation that they're all valid, notwithstanding that there's a big argument about it. And then in terms of the demand for ACUs, is that expected to mostly come uh, from, from those uh, businesses, the top 100 emitters that are affected uh, by the safeguard scheme and where I think the Demand is due to grow, I can't remember, eight, nine, ten million units a year due to them having to drop their carbon emissions or buy credits of something like four or five percent a year from memory. Yes, yeah. So the demand's going to grow quite significantly over the next few years. It starts off slow, but but yeah, so we expect to see um, you know, everything else being the same, the um the acu price start uh, you know, start to increase. Um, and and really at thirty six dollars is you know inter, you know on an international comparison it's still relatively low, you know, and really we're suffering from the you know the oversupply of existing contracts that are now available for safeguard issues. And in terms of new projects, do you have a this will be my I hard back to Giles as the demand for them increases because the of the ratcheting effect of the um, uh, safeguard scheme. Uh, do you, you know, what is the cost of new projects? Can we continue to supply projects at, at the current price or, or will prices have to go up to get more supply and therefore it will end up costing these big emitters more and what I'm interested in, encourage them to do, actually take action rather than just buying credit units? Well, I think uh, I think we'd expect all of that to happen. Um, and unfortunately, I just don't have a good enough handle on the um, on the cost structure of um, a lot of these um, uh, sort of uh, agricultural projects. But what I would say though is that as the price increases, it becomes a lot more attractive for businesses to um, to upgrade their own um, own equipment. Um, and and I, I would have thought that there's a lot of opportunities for um, uh, for emission reductions from a lot of these sites. Um, that you know they would have available to them even at a sort of uh, reasonably competitive price, I would have thought.
Rick, I'm just kind of interested. Um, I know that before the Senate, um, there was a, um, a committee looking into the Renewable Guarantee of Origin um, scheme, this proposal. Um, it sounds like a really, I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of struggling to understand exactly how it's going to work. I mean, it sounds like a really good idea. Basically, you sort of get a guarantee of origin. So if you're producing green hydrogen or, or doing whatever, you know, it's actually is coming from renewables. But there seems to be a lot of controversy about the structure of the scheme. If the scheme is 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 needed, um, there's particularly focus on the fact that some of the old below baseline snowy, uh, sorry, um, hydro projects generators from from snowy hydro and hydro Tasmania things that were built 50 years ago, which were excluded from the uh, from the REC scheme, and so couldn't get RECs. And there seems to be a suggestion that they should also be able to, or they should now be able to. Um, generate uh, regos um, and sell them and, and, and presumably just will get windfall profits from them. Um, what's, what's, um, can you sort of describe your observations and, and, and your feelings about this? I, I know there's a lot of divergent views. Well, it comes back to um, the rego scheme is really, a, you know, how you allocate existing, existing projects to um, people who want to make cl environmental claims. Um, and so... And that's fine, but I think it doesn't really solve our problem that we're still going to be short of 80% 80, 80 renewables by, um, uh, by 2030 or whatever the target is, that we need to be much more ambitious. And so we still need to drive new investment. So Red Joe's, I can't see is driving new investment, really. It's just reallocating or someone being able to lay claim to um, sort of uh, some electricity in the national electricity market that happens to be renewable. But but by twenty. 30, we're going to have, you know, what, 60, 70% of the electricity is going to be renewable. So it's a bit of a nonsense, really. But I get, though, that people who are exporting emission intensive, um, emission intensive product may want to make claims. And so they should be able to do that. But all you need to do is demonstrate you've contracted with. Uh, with one of these renewable entities. Yeah. And, um, can't, can't someone give them a stamp or something like that? Well, yeah, that's what we thought. What do we do? <laughs> um, but and I think, um, but in any in any case, the, it's hard to see them being of any value because who was going to who wants to make these claims? Um, and you know, they, the the real issue really is um, we need more renewables to meet you know to phase out coal quicker. Um, and so all we're doing is just shuffling, you know, we're shuffling around um, who can who can claim what's already there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be interesting to see where all that one lands. I'm pretty interested too in the energy efficiency schemes in Victoria because they've been, um, they're probably the most um, efficient, if that's the word, for an efficient energy efficiency scheme, at least I think they are. Um, and they've really been recently been expanded for another 15 years. Can you tell us sort of what's happening and, and why that's either good or bad? Okay, so the Victorian government um, last week announced that um, it was extending its um, uh, Victor the its scheme, the Victorian Energy Upgrades Pro uh, uh, Program, to um, 2045 to line up with their um, net zero commitment to 2045. And and just to put that into context, um, uh, New South Wales is uh, has an energy savings scheme um, and also a peak demand reduction scheme. Both of those. Uh, go until 2050, and again, they line up with the New South Wales government's commitment to net zero by 2050. So that's the first point. So with the great that the, the Victorian government has announced an extension of the scheme, because otherwise it was meant to finish in 2030. Um, what they also announced is that they're going to um, uh, set the target, because normally the target uh, under the VEU is set every five years, and they're in the process of doing that now, but they're only going to set the target for two years, um, and for 26 and 27, uh, because they're also in the middle of what's called a strategic review, um, which will take a couple of years to implement. So, um, the, and the plan, as we, as we understand from the government, is that um, it's to drive, um, in particular, electrification. Um, so the real challenge um, uh, we have in Australia, but in particular Victoria, is to get off gas. Um, so we're doing pretty well in reducing emissions from electricity with the rollout of renewables. Getting rid of gas is 
either. We really haven't done much on that. Um, and I think that's one of the really important things to watch in Victoria. Um, they're pushing forward with the BU. It'll be a focus on both getting rid of gas and also broader electrification. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's really potentially, that's the next challenge we've got. I, the two challenges I see um, is reducing emissions, particularly gas, and so we need some effective policies there. And the second one is to make sure that electrification, um, you know, does not um, is done in an effective way and doesn't just make peak demand worse and trigger a massive need for network investment. So, hence, behind the meter storage. Uh, demand side activities that reduce peak demand are really important. I, I, I my own view is that um, uh, business uh, uh, reduce process heat, ch- moving gas out of there and replacing it with electricity uh, actually will make the system much more flexible. Because in general, boilers and things like that can be turned up and down uh, to suit just uh, quite quickly to respond to price. That's that's my own opinion. Rick, but do you think um, that these efficiency schemes are actually driving uh, in New South Wales and in Victoria are are actually driving much behaviour? I mean, is is there even much awareness of them outside people like yourself? You you never see anyone talking about them. Well, I think that's it's a fair, uh, interesting observation, David. But I think I think what tends to happen is sort of like it's sort of like electricity, you know. Who the hell bothers with the sort of um, you know value of lost load and five minute pricing and and whatnot? As long as there's simple um, simple product offerings to um, end consumers, so what's important for the end consumer is for them to know that if you're going to um, sort of decommission your um, central you know your central central gas fired heater uh, and put in split systems or something else, government is going to support that, and that's going to reduce emissions. Uh, and that's essentially what happens with, um, we're seeing that uh, probably one of the key activities now being rolled out in Victoria is um, is the sort of heating cooling, so decommissioning sort of gas, gas heating, and putting in, um, you know, uh, electric, electric options. And do consumers realise uh, that they're getting a cost reduction as a result of that? Well, they should do. It's sort of like yeah. with PB. With sort of like with PB, um, all they see is they're getting a cheaper price, and you know how many certificates and how many emission reductions they're not really too fussed about. But they, but they do see the cheaper price, do they? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's the whole point of this of the scheme is to actually drop significantly drop the price so that it's a compelling uh, proposition for customers to change over. And is there much evidence of them changing over? Uh, we're starting to see, um, certainly in heating and cooling, it's starting to ramp up now um, in Victoria from a low base, I might add, but it's, yeah, we're starting to see that. Um, getting off hot water is a bit problematic uh, at the moment because there's not enough there's not enough incentive and, and this is one of the complications and we're, one of the complications as soon as you deal with electrification, um, you really need to look at Emission factors and the emission factors are time. It's time of use emission factors uh, then rolled out into activity specific uh, abatement. And and what I mean by that is that um, if you've got a smart um, sort of if you've got PV and then put in a, um, a a heat pump and decommission gas, well yours should be zero emission. But you're at the moment. Um, you're given the average grid intensity, so the scheme needs to be more nuanced. Um, and this is part of the review process to uh, to make the scheme scheme hasn't really been effective in driving electrification, and hence part of the review. And this is the emission factor is one of the really interesting things because uh, you can imagine we know we're going to get to um, you know 80, 90 percent renewables. But we're not there yet, and so technically today the emission intensity of electricity is still really high. Sure, uh, and particularly when you've got brown coal in Victoria, and, exactly. and just 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 on the business electrification, you know, converting bakeries and uh, restaurants and stuff and like that to electric uh, 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 um, ovens and, and equivalent 
Is there any move there and do they still benefit from certificates and stuff like that? Yes, that they do. Um, a bit more problematic, well, not probably not so much problematic, much more complicated because then you need a measurement and verification method. And so one of the things we do need to come up with better methods to be able to simply calculate the emission reductions from the activity. Uh, but yes, you're technically able to do it, but it's still pretty complicated. It's interesting. We just moved into a new house um, up in the uh, northern rivers of uh, New South Wales and um, discovered um, 46 halogen lights, which never got converted. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Have I got a a mission abatement um, project for you? (laughs) Well, we actually did try and sort of um, sort of engage some of the um, the 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 registered providers um, that. um, one of them said they don't have people in the area, and the other one didn't have even bothered responding. So um, anyway, never mind. Yeah, um, let's go to Bunnings. Just go to Bunnings and get some lights. <laughs> Put them in myself. Fair enough. Well, it depends, depends what you need to replace. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're um, yeah. Look, it's um, reasonably complex, and uh, we we got a horrifying quote from one electrician, but that wasn't actually using the um, the incentives under the scheme. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in just getting back to the LGC market, actually, Rick, and just um, and, and and seeing. So, I mean, there's obviously some sort of great uncertainty there over what happens in sort of coming years and things like that. So, what are renewable energy developers thinking about the LGC market when when they're kind of sort of um, assessing their projects? Are they thinking that um, well, maybe they can go merchant for a short time and then sort of lock in some sort of fixed contract, which might be a bundled contract, including energy and LGC. So, well, look, I, I've heard that they're doing sort of all of the above, um, and and I think, but generally looking at um, uh, sort of the underwriting, you know, sort of the underwriting scheme to make sure that they can um, sort of get a, a you know repay their debt essentially, um, and uh, but. But yeah, that's one of the things they're going to have to deal with, you know. And and people have been trying to um, uh, sort of contract with um, sort of large corporates, um, you know, for their LGC needs. Um, but yeah, it's 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 yeah. There's a whole mishmash of different approaches. Um, yeah. But yeah, and it's really hard. It's really hard to get uh, to get a handle on what might happen post 2030 uh, if. If anything's relevant, and so I'm not sure what, what, you know, what you should be putting in your model post 2030, <laughs> you know, and we, we've got pricing up up to 2030. We've got a forward market, um, and so we have the price does you know, tail tail off quite quite markedly, but there still is some value in 2030. Oh, Rick, just very briefly, I mean, I, I think about these things pretty hard and I, I look at the new supply coming on and the 80% target, et cetera, but you've been in the industry since forever. Overall, in terms of uh, progress and stuff, you've uh, over the next looking forward, are you sort of optimistic or pessimistic that we'll start moving faster or in terms of moving faster or slower? Oh, you shouldn't have asked me, David, I'm pessimistic. Um, we've got a... It's, I'm really pessimistic about the sort of emission targets federally. Um, I think Labor's been really disappointing on the um, on the 42%. Um, state governments much more aggressive. New South Wales, 75. Um, you know, Victoria, 75 to 80 percent reduction by 2035. We need, and and even that's really not enough um, to sort of keep the uh, the the temperature safe for the climate. Um, and so, yeah, that's my biggest fear. We're not moving fast enough. I think the um, the renewables industry has been, um, you know, has mobilised, but we haven't. There's been not enough projects um, starting construction in the last couple of years. We've been slow. We're too slow. We're slowing down. It looks that way. I agree. I, I think you could also see it as just building the foundations securely if you want to take a more optimistic view uh, making sure that the the foundations are there in terms of the transmission and the renewable energy zones and even the community acceptance and uh, and that it'll come with a burst uh, uh, in towards the end of the decade. That's that's my own view. But. You, I hope so. But there's stuff we could be doing. You know, uh, there's more we could be incentivising the rooftop, you know, rooftop market. Particularly, you know, we've got, you know, 
the um, capacity investment scheme, you know, essentially replaces the RET, but we've got nothing to replace the small scale. No, I agree. The small, the SREC uh, is declining, and I just was today thinking that you could extend batteries, actually household batteries, into the SREC scheme yeah. uh, quite easily. And that's what we'd been advocating for that, but there's no sign from anything from the federal government. Although I did, uh, I was, um, I did notice quite optimistically that there was um, a media re report earlier this week that the government is considering potentially an, an announcement before the election. So, yeah, and no, I just hope it's not another loan program which have have not been effective in the space. Yeah. So, so what was the I mean, you said the loan schemes haven't been very effective. Um, so what do you want? What do you want to see in place? Oh, it's sort of like, um, I think what's worked is the, um, the program like the, like the RET um, and, and sort of, as we discussed, continuing the um, uh, continuing support um, for PV, but for PV with batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and driving, you know, so it's the one thing we can drive is more batteries. And I think... Um, one of the sort of really positive announcements, um, albeit it was only a target, um, was the New South Wales government committing to um, a million batteries by by 2035. Um, and so we thought that was a great target and um, and they have got a policy mechanism at the moment, the peak demand reduction scheme, that actually is provide will be providing support uh, for batteries. But I think that needs to be upgraded now um, in light of the new ambition. Right, right, and just getting back to the capacity investment scheme because I mean, yeah, I mean it, that's that's not going to get us to eighty percent, but it get us reasonably close. I mean, do you think? Do you actually have doubts that that's actually going to be effective in actually getting the capacity built that it's targeting? Um, because I think that I, I think you guys have actually sort of estimated that that might take us to sixty nine or seventy percent or something in 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 that that area. Um, are you sort of doubtful that'll even get that far because of all the other problems that lay ahead for all those projects, for instance, transmission and planning approvals and and, and anything else? Well, I think I'd make two, obs uh, two observations. One, that we're probably going slower than we initially thought, which is, as we discussed, you know, we could go faster, but yeah, okay, as long I'm not going to, we're not going to be too fast if we meet our target a couple of years later. The other issue though is that we're adding a lot more electricity consumption now and so you're looking at maybe over the next sort of 10 years or so maybe a bit more we're going to add 25 percent to our electricity consumption so all of a sudden your your 80 percent renewables are off the lower base it is not enough yeah. we need to contract more yeah, yeah. Well, that was actually the, exactly the point that came out in the International Energy Agency with its World, Econo uh, World Energy Outlook this week. Um, it just sort of pointed to the fact that um, wind and solar investments have increased dramatically over the last 12 to 18 months, um, thanks to their sort of continuing falling prices, at least on a, on a global level. We might not have seen them in, in Australia for, for various supply chain reasons. And they say that's getting closer. It's now 2.7 times um, the capacity that existed before. So that sort of gets it within reach of that sort of three times trebling of capacity by 2030. But because of that increase in demand, it's not just demand centers, it's electrification, it's EVs, it's also heat waves and the increased yep. demand for that. Um, that even more needs to be done because it just won't deliver the reduction in the fossil fuels that, um, that are required. That's exactly right. I mean, because, and I think in some ways we, we know what we need to do to um, decarbonise electricity, and I think this, it's now sort of reasonably cost-effective to do that. It's the next challenge is to get off gas, and then to um, to get off you know liquid fuels for transport. And, and that's all part, I guess, of the sort of electrification thing. I mean, are, are we sort of buying into the efficiency, or, or or does efficiency come with electrification? I mean, to a certain extent, it does, simply because fossil fuel burning is just so damn inefficient. You lose sixty to seventy percent, or sometimes even more, with with, with um, some car engines. Yeah. Because we often hear, you know, we always talk about supply side and building enough generation to meet demand, blah, 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 blah. Um, electrification is going to create more demand. It might be more efficient. But are we doing enough yet? Are we focused enough yet on the efficiency part of the equation, just making people, I don't know what needs to be done. I don't know whether it's sort of, 
you know, driving sort of top down from governments sort of saying this must be done, we, we need to do this, or is there awareness amongst consumers about how much money they could possibly save if only they, you know, were more, more efficient? Actually, it's, a, it's an interesting observation, Giles, because I, I think the, um, we're changing how we talk about this. Um, and in fact, in some ways, we want to be more inefficient in the middle of the day you know, and in other words, it's efficiencies doesn't really matter when we're spilling. At the moment, we're spilling an enormous amount of renewables in the middle of the in, in middle of the day when we've um, when it you know an unlovely sunny day. Um, and so, what we really need to do is either store it or use it. Um, and so, the real issue now is trying to move it, sort of repurpose um, electricity use in the middle of the day, um, and. And even if you're less efficient, it's efficiency is not the problem anymore because you can have, you can afford to be less efficient as long as you're not using electricity during peak times, because then that's much more expensive. And then and think about it outside of the middle of the day is also when you've got a higher emission intensity of electricity generation when you when you don't when you don't have generating. And so, so I think we need to think about it a little bit differently. Um, yeah, sure. It, you know, efficiency is fine, but you want you. We don't want to be using more electricity uh, at peak times. Fine if we use it in the middle of the day. Uh, and then that's important for how you char- You know, your charge, and that's important for batteries and making sure that as we're supporting batteries, um, you know, we're rec- we're giving due recognition for the ones coming into VPP and encouraging VPP. I might also say the um, the New South Wales government came up with a um, not only the one million battery target, but also I think it was three thousand four hundred megawatts of VPPs was one of the targets too, and so that's a really important part of this mix. Um, you know, if you if you've got if you think about it, you got three thousand four hundred um, megawatts of, P, of batteries by um, twenty thirty five. That's on that subject to VPP. You know, New South Wales peak demand is fourteen thousand megawatts at the moment, so that's a significant proportion of oh. peak demand. Now, of course, that's you know that's not available. That's only available sort of uh, on a short term basis, the the three thousand four hundred. But nevertheless, if, my my point is, you've got um, that's the important signal we need is to do, be delivering sort of capacity and and battery capacity and or, and or demand reduction at the time of peaks. Well, it's going to be fascinating to see, and um, it's interesting that you're sort of hearing, you know, sort of word that um, maybe something might be coming up before the election. Because it wouldn't surprise me that both sides of the political debate, even though they're sort of like complete opposites when it comes to sort of large scale generation, one's renewables and one wants nuclear. Um, I think they both understand the attraction of rooftop and and the potential for battery storage um, to actually sort of create a very useful and 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 popular. Um, I think so. It's going to be interesting to see what evolves there. Are you sort of getting senses from both sides of the corridor or are you um, um, – tell us more about what you've heard. Tell us more about what you've heard, Rick. <laughs> well, well, I, actually, I must admit, I keep asking. and um, But uh, the, the sort of feedback is um, not this term, but they could announce something this term. Um, and so um, – and I'm hopeful that, you know, there there is work being done no, we think there is work being done, and hopeful that there's going to be an announcement uh, before the election. Um, and and you're right, you're right. The um, the opposition's really keen on um, on not so much on wind, but yeah, they're happy with solar, particularly rooftop solar and batteries. Yeah, that's sort of think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's sort of interesting to see what they come up with. Um, yeah. Well, look, Rick, I do sort of feel like we've just kind of scratched the surface and all the sort of the subjects there, the LGCs, the regos, the ACUs, the energy efficiency schemes and all those things. But look, um, it's been great having you on. Um, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks, Giles. It's always a pleasure. Good on you. And look, we'll be, we'll be back in a second uh, with um, uh, some review of the news of the week. Um, we're just back with uh, Rick Rosali from um, Green Energy Trading, and um, we're just having a, a quick chat afterwards. And I thought it was worth recording because one of the issues that we sort of talked about was the equity issues, particularly for those who don't own their own houses, their renters, things like that. And just making sure that they're sort of, you know, share in the uh, benefits of um, PV and storage and electrification, and how to ensure they do. And I wish got some ideas there. Sort of, um, yeah. Um, what do you think, Rick? Well, thanks. 
Yeah, the, well, one of the challenges we've got as we drive to reduce emissions and um, and encourage households to embrace sort of you know smarter, better technologies to reduce their energy bills, um, we do need to remember that there's a bunch of people in our community who are actually potentially locked out of some of these opportunities, and um, and this is in particular renters and and um, people low income people uh, who generally rent, and uh, and we do need to make sure that. As we move to decarbonise, we don't forget them, and we sort of, in the end, roll our policies to actually um, sort of help them. Because there's a lot of, in other words, there's a lot of community benefits that we're actually not gaining if um, if we don't um, uh, if we don't sort of develop that sector of the market. So there's a couple of options um, that a lot of these have been tried either in Australia or, or overseas. Uh, let me quickly go through. Firstly, having mandated minimum energy performance standards, um, uh, the Victorian government started to roll some of those out. We started a process to roll those out and think about ensuring that all homes have got insulation um, and have smart, you know, and basically doing some minimum um, weather sealing and the like, it potentially even, um, you know, more efficient heating and cooling. The next thing is you could do, um, uh, and we've been talking about this for this next item for more than 10 years is mandated minimum energy uh, performance standards. So, um, sorry, the mandated disclosure of, of energy performance and think about um, basically when houses are bought or sold uh, or leased, um, then you need to have a, an energy rating on the house. ACT's had that um, and we've been talking about for ages. What that would mean is you'd you'd identify which houses uh, are really poor performing, and then you could actually target those, and then require something to be done with them. And then the last item is um, uh, is some states like South Australia and ACT in their energy saving schemes have got what we call a priority household target. So that means that in those cases, twenty odd percent of the certificates and the energy upgrades that are implemented under the scheme need to come from um, households that are, have got a concession card holder in the household. So that way, we start to um, uh, to deliver sort of, you know, both energy savings and also potentially PV and batteries to, to these households. And are we getting any signs of traction from some of the other states then? Um, I think uh, certainly Victoria, I'd say uh, Victoria, Victoria and ACT probably so the ACT leading on this. Um, the Victoria now is starting to look at a number of these policies, um, and and we're both in the Vic- Victorian Energy Upgrades Review and the New South Wales um, Review of the Energy Savings Scheme. Uh, we're advocating for a priority household target as a way to deal with the equity issues. You know, so uh, yet yes, I think definitely politicians are, are interested in this, um, and a lot of times. Um, we get pushback, particularly labor po- from federal labor politicians, about being concerned about supporting greater household emission reduction, like from PV batteries and the like, because they're concerned about um, sort of middle class welfare. Um, and so I think we def- we really need to address this issue head on um, if we're going to be successful in, um, in decarbonizing. Good stuff. Okay. Well, look, uh, thanks once again, Rick, for joining us on the um, Energy Insiders podcast. Thanks, Giles. And uh, we'll be back in a short time with David um, discussing the uh, news of the week. Energy Insiders is brought to you by Next Tracker, delivering some of the highest performing solar assets in the country. With local manufacturing right here in Australia, Next Tracker's market leading solar solutions deliver optimal return on investment and superior extreme weather resilience for utility solar farms in Australia. Check out their flagship NX Horizon Smart Solar Tracker, their intelligent optimization software, and the industry's most advanced terrain following solar tracking technology, NX Horizon XTR. The Southern Hemisphere's largest clean energy event, All Energy Australia, returns to the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre, October 23 and 24. 
This conference and exhibition is a must for industry suppliers and experts and those involved in the renewable energy and energy storage sectors. Featuring over 400 suppliers, 450 industry speakers and attracting more than 12,000 industry professionals, you can't miss this free event. Register now for All Energy Australia, October 23 and 24 at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. back with the uh, Energy Insiders podcast with uh, Giles Parkinson and David Leach. Um, David, some looks some really interesting things happening um, there, which uh, Rick mentioned. I just wanted to clarify a little bit about the REGOs, the Renewable Energy Generation um, um, Guarantee of Origin Certificates. The controversy, which I kind of mentioned before, sort of arose out of a parliamentary Senate session this week when Hydro Tasmania came out and said, well, we would like the regos to be applicable to the um, below baseline um, production, which is the you know half a century old hydro in um, in Tasmania and the Snow Mountains, and for that to be um, those certificates to be available now. And um, basically, the opposition to that is that one, it would declare it would deliver an unnecessary windfall to both Hydro Tasmania and Snowy, and two, it could also result in a big dilution of the price for LGCs um, and be a bit of a cop-out. So there's obviously going to be a bit of debate going on there. And I just want to sort of clarify that because I wasn't too sure if I was exactly clear about that um, in a discussion with Crick. That's great, uh, Giles. And uh, it's probably about as clear as your uh, uh, very successful attempt, I would say, to uh, go for the Batuta Advocate Award. Uh, by pointing out uh, the absurdity, the absolute absurdity, and it is so funny how the real world is always funnier than any comedian can ever make it. Here we have a company, Origin, uh, that has uh, commissioned no new renewable capacity, not built any. You can find reasons, good or bad, why they haven't done so while they were under takeover, but then complaining that not enough renewable capacity is coming on the line. I mean, you know, I'm surprised Energy Australia and AGL won't be joining a joint letter, you know, fairly soon saying, you know, we're, we're unhappy because not enough renewable capacity is, is coming online soon enough for us to try and exploit it. Well, they probably have been in, 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 in certain ways. I mean, if you look at all the negotiations over the... Um over the capacity, the original capacity scheme and things like that, that's exactly what they were arguing. So, um, yes, look, I'm starting to get a bit pissed off, actually, um, with the with the attitude of um, too many of these big utilities. Um, well, I think, you know, this the LRET scheme, which we discussed, had this one uh, benefit, or well, one of its benefits was that it did require essentially all the uh, Gentiles to have a certain share of renewable energy or uh, pay premiums and have to pass that on to their customers. And, you know, my sort of um, uh, idea in the shower, my thought bubble for this week, which probably wouldn't stand up for five seconds of real scrutiny, is that um, uh, residents in renewable energy zones uh, should all be offered, uh, once a certain amount of capacity is built in the zone, say the Irana zone, say it gets, you know, 3,000 megawatts of capacity built there, uh, or 4,000, that all the uh, residents should get a, a discount on their electricity bills, uh, you know, for 20 years or something like that. And basically, uh, that should be paid for by a levy on Gentilers that don't have a certain share of um, renewable energy in their mix. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. I mean, we should actually point out that some developers are actually offering this now. Um, I'm not too sure why it wasn't offered sort of, you know, uh, years and years ago, but they're sort of coming around to do that. So, um... Well, it all costs money, you know. I mean, what, what the discount that they offer, that a wind company offers to residents in a region, whilst it's a perfectly good idea, has to be recovered somewhere, right? It doesn't change the cost of building and developing the electricity. And what what one person gets as a discount has to be paid for by someone else as a premium. Yeah, I guess um, probably, um, I, wonder just, I wonder if it's cheaper than sort of fighting it through the courts and doing all the other things they have to do to, when they get lots of complaints. Um, mind you, as we saw this week, um, we haven't actually seen the story because I haven't published it yet, but uh, we're doing this really interesting story about, um, you know, one of these projects out in the southwest of uh, New South Wales. Um, and this really, I mean, there's some huge projects um, being built there, as we've discussed previously. This was no, really interesting. would like to be built there. Would like would to be like built. To be. That's, 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 that's very true. Um, this was 
questions about the Pottinger um, Energy Park, which has been proposed by Summerver and um, AGL. It's actually sort of climbed on board. It's a mixture of you know, gigawatt of wind, some solar, and, and, and um, a really big battery, possibly up to 2,000 megawatt hours. Um, it's going through the, been going through the planning process in New South Wales. Not a single objection within 20 kilometres of the project. Uh, a few objections in the local area up to about 100 k's, and then a lot of objections um, from even further afield. Um, you know, from si- Tamworth, Sydney, no Queensland, Victoria, South Australia. Um, a lot of them complaining about the view. Um, <laughs> And uh, can I point out, that's the third renewable, the very large renewable energy project in that area that has uh, gone through with very few local, and two of them with hardly any objections of any description. Well, um, maybe no and, one lives there, I don't know, but um, I, I, th- I well, think... Well, there aren't think, that many... <laughs> well, there is that, but there, there's also been some, I, I think there's actually been some some pretty good work done on, on the ground by, by, um, by some of these organisations. There's that, Giles, and there's also the fact that the councils themselves uh, were very proactive. You might uh, um, uh, remember the interview we did with uh, Professor Cole, who pointed out that uh, it, it's not good ask necessarily always the way to ask the government. The councils down there, as I understand it, decided that they would this was probably going to happen, and they would they should get positioned to actually make it work for them and for their uh, communities, which is what they've done. And uh, as I've been saying time after time, uh, uh, areas like New England are going to miss out uh, because the business will go uh, to where it's most easy to build. And there are lots of reasons to build electricity in the Southwest Renewable Energy Zone and one reason not to. And the reasons to do it is that, yes, it does have uh, a good level of community approval at the moment. And the second reason is that it's basically relatively flat with not too many trees. And because it's flat, you can get the cranes in there quite nice and easily and build these nice tall uh, uh, hubs that you need to access the wind there. And the problem is that the transmission that is proposed, which is basically it sits on the link between uh, Project Energy Connect, uh, VNI West and HumeLink, is that there's nowhere near enough capacity uh, between all three of those links to, to get the generation out. Which is why I think that one of the policies that uh, someone should be pursuing a lot harder is to take Alex Wanhas and no doubt other people's idea of using batteries uh, to in, at either end of the transmission line to get a lot more transmission uh, through uh, is something that should, we should be pursuing very hard right now. And that when you're building these transmission lines, you should be sizing the switch gear and other bits and pieces for uh, as much capacity as you might imagine it might have rather than just the immediate capacity. Yes, well, I think there's been a lot of sort of um, thinking about that um, from some of the people that were involved in the planning and just wondering why the hell they didn't actually go to the maximum amount of capacity. But look, some of these projects are building huge batteries as it is, and maybe they can just sort of pick them up and move them or rather pick them up and move them, um, place them at either end of the transmission line and sort of say, here, have this, um, if that means they can actually produce um, and, and send more into the grid. But um, we shall see sometime reasonably soon, possibly by the end of the year or maybe in January, the results of the um, the bidding for the access rights to that southwest zone. Um, and um, at the same time, um, the results of the capacity investment scheme, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be linked somehow. I'm not too sure if they're supposed to, but um, it would seem bizarre if they were. So that's going to be really interesting to see how that comes out. Um, David, um, the coalition has been making a lot of noise about putting gas back into the capacity investment scheme, including existing gas. Um, Bowen has said just how ridiculous it is, the renewable energy industry has been saying how ridiculous that is. But there's been an awful lot of sort of support analysts and lobby groups and other people sort of saying, oh, well, it's a really good idea because we need that much gas. Um your thoughts, please. Well, the first thought is that uh, we don't need uh, a lot of gas. We need c- gas capacity, but not gas energy, uh, and by and large. Secondly, I think from the... Uh, I'm not really a politician, but uh, I think it's crazy the way you let Ted O'Brien run the agenda or Peter Dutton. I mean, what should be happening is that the government should be triumphing and uh, long and proud on the achievements that they actually have made after a decade of complete nothingness uh, from Abbott, Turnbull and uh, Morrison, the combined thing, what was the sum of their achievements was to get rid of the carbon price that we had. 
uh, um, but uh, since you know the current Labor government has been in power, and uh, and I'm not speaking as a Labor person, but as a policy person, firstly we've had the vehicle emission standards, which is a reform that uh, no government has been able to achieve in you know for 30 or 40 years before that. And I think will go down as a long-lasting achievement that will last for a long time. Uh, we've had the tightening of the um, um, uh, top 100 standards, the safeguard scheme. Although I think that more work could be done on that to limit the use of ACUs for satisfaction of that. Uh, and then we have got the capacity investment scheme and the transmission fund, which so far haven't achieved very much. Let's be honest. But you could argue that um, foundations have been laid for what will be achieved over the next three or four years. And that's the agenda that we should be talking about. That's the agenda that uh, journalists should be asking about, uh, not uh, about how much, whether gas should be in the CIS and how does that relate to keeping coal stations open and uh, talking about nuclear fantasies uh, for the next 20 years while, while actually achieving next to nothing. Mm. And uh, you've written a very thoughtful piece, which will be published on Renew Economy um, by the time this podcast is um, is also published. So um, do have a look out for that. Look, um, we should probably wrap up pretty soon, um, David. But look, we did mention uh, um, Origin Energy before, um, but they have made an interesting purchase, that of uh, Solar Quotes, um, one of the uh, great sort of aggregators of the uh, the solar business. Um, they've been around for ages. Um, Finn Peacock um, uh, business. Um, it's interesting. One that um, uh, Solar Quotes would sell. Um, two that Origin would buy, and Origin also sort of um, linking it with this decision not to bother um, doing its own installations. Now it's going to use Solar Quotes basically to sort of um, feed installations into others. So um, um, it's an interesting purchase, and comes in the same week also that uh, Rooftop Solar. Um, past another sort of master, which is um, delivering um, more than fifty percent of grid demand at uh, one particular point, but um, yeah, it's a master we, to know. We mentioned in the interview, Giles, about household batteries and how they're the missing piece in the whole thing. When you look at the renewable energy shares that we're getting at the moment overall, the uh, very noticeable thing when you know what you're looking at is that utility solar uh, generation hasn't gone up this uh, this spring, uh, certainly nothing like the way the rooftop solar has gone up. And that's no fault of the capacity. It's be it's because it's been curtailed all the time. And it's because in the market as it sits right now, there isn't enough uh, storage capacity relative to the amount of solar capacity. And the easiest way to fix that going forward is probably by something has to be done about this um, conflict between rooftop solar, which I'm a great supporter of, and utility solar, because right now it's just not working, uh, the market. And to imagine that more utility solar would be approved under the capacity investment scheme, as it was under the last New South Wales Altessa, without having uh, firstly sorted out the storage kind of issues, is, is, is silly in my opinion. So, well, we will see. I'm just going to put a clarification on that. I think capacity investment scheme, I think AUMO services who are managing that on behalf of the federal government are making clear that um, um, they are favouring projects which do have an element of storage in them. So, maybe. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's good. But um, there's still this big elephant there of all this rooftop solar that doesn't even know about the price, doesn't even know there's a wholesale market price for the most part, let alone switching on or off. And the fact that uh, you know storage is most valuable when it's uh, as is solar generation when it's put close to the point of consumption. Anyway, I uh, uh, we we, we um, maybe that's uh, 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 enough to say. <laughs> okay, thanks, David. Um, look, thanks to Rick Brazali from Green Energy Markets for um, joining us earlier. Um, thanks to everyone listening out there. Thanks, of course, to our sponsors, uh, Next Tracker. Pylon and Effigen for your ongoing and continuing support and um, we'll be back with another episode of Energy Insiders uh, next week. Um, look out for us at the All Energy Conference in Melbourne. We actually do have a booth uh, which we've got some cool things happening there so pop round and say hello if we're not, not free, free t-shirts Free t-shirts, no not free actually. Um, Baseball caps? <laughs> 
I think we've got a couple of can openers left open at left over actually, so um, they might be free. Um, and we did have some sort of stubby holders, but they got nicked at the last one. But um, anyway, never mind. Um, wandering. Um, come and say hello. Um, it'll be good to catch up, and um, we'll be back with another episode of the Energy Insiders podcast uh, next week, hopefully. Bye for now. Energy Insiders was brought to you by Evergen, the market-leading renewable energy software business that optimises residential and commercial solar and battery systems. Evergen enables large numbers of systems to operate as a single fleet, so network operators can use them as a virtual power plant, generating significant value for consumers, network operators and the energy system as a whole. Evergen software is powering the energy system of the future. Energy Insiders was also brought to you by Pylon. Pylon provides easy-to-use, solid design software for installers and retailers with pay-as-you-go pricing, no monthly cost and no locking contracts. Join Australia's top solar companies who trust Pylon to design high-resolution, CEC-ready solar proposals.